thank you so much for coming, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending this event, which is this uh, series of talks that we are doing here at the University of Los Andes. Um, yes, related to related to so, I mean, important issues in petroleum engineering in Colombia, the Colombian industry, and I mean, the in general, the oil industry worldwide, but more, more especially or, or more closely the oil industry in Colombia. And uh, so we are doing a couple of, we have been, this is the second talk that we do on, on, on what we consider to be like uh, models of, 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 of uh, oil industries worldwide. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we, we had a guest from Norway, from the Norwegian Petroleum in, uh, Ministry. Ministry and he he gave us a presentation of on how did they did, how did they build or how did they set up the the, the original industry which of course is a is a world example and this time we have a, the example that we want to show you today is, is the Brazilian example which is closer to us I mean Brazil is a Latin American country it's close to closer culturally and ethnically and everything is closer to us than Norway. And they did it. I mean, they 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 set up a, a world class industry they have right now in, in Norway, which is in particular the offshore industry, which is uh, the, the main source of oil in, the, in Brazil, of course. And they managed to develop a, a world class industry. Uh, and we want to hear how how did they do that. So this is what we want to do today. And for that, then we have a guest uh, graciously. Uh, 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 do you say? <laughs> I mean, we, we were putting we were putting touch by with the, through the Brigitte was, was through the Brazilian embassy or through whom or to Petrobras that we got to, to the ministry to the Ministry of Petroleum in Brazil. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so the ministry, the ministry, graciously the Ministry of Petroleum in Brazil uh, helped us and they identified a suitable person for this. And her name is Heloisa Bor Borges. Is the pronunciation in Portuguese? I I, I presume. Eloisa Borges Esteves. Eloisa is a, she has a PhD, a doctorate degree, and a master's degree, and a bachelor's degree in economics from the Federal University of Rio, which is a, one of the best universities in Brazil, one of the best universities in Latin America, by the way. Uh, Eloisa, is, Eloisa is also a, a lawyer. She has a law degree um, from the State University of Rio de Janeiro. <coughs> and uh, she was a visiting scholar at the University of Virginia Law School. Uh, in the United States, of course, and she also was a fellow at Columbia, presume, uh, Columbia University, of course, one of the most prestigious law schools in the United States and in the world. She was a fellow at Columbia Women's Leadership Program at Columbia University in New York City. Uh, uh, she, she's a, as, a, as a professional, she has authored uh, or co-authored uh, several research papers that have been published in several uh, index uh, journals worldwide and also book chapters uh, on, on energy economics, on, on economic regulation, on law and economics and antitrust uh, uh, law regulation. Uh, she has several, she has, uh, she, she has occupied several positions in the Brazilian public administration, both as an academic and as a public servant in the federal government. And she joined uh, the National Agency for Petroleum and Natural Gas uh, and Biofuels in 2005, which is a very large agency, a regulatory agency in, in Brazil. Is uh, I, I think it's, it's abbreviated AMP. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, so she has occupied several positions in the in the agency. Uh, for one very important um, role that she has played is to be responsible for the Brazilian bidding rounds. Uh, held by the ANP in the years 2018 and 2019. So the, those are the bidding rounds that, in which the Brazilian government offers the, the blocks for exploitation to the international companies. Uh, so it's a very important uh, job, of course. And also the model and review of the Brazilian tender protocols. I mean, how, how, how companies can make offers of uh, to, to the Brazilian government and how to study and consider those offers, of course. And PSC contracts, which is a type of contract that is using the oil industry between the between the governments and the and the exploitation exploitation companies, let's say, uh, between 2017 and 2019. Uh, since May 2020 this year, Eloisa joined the Energy Research Office in in, in, in the federal Brazilian government. 
and her role is her position or her title is director for oil, natural gas, and biofuel studies. So she's a person that is superly qualified, of course, to tell us how how this uh, how how is how what are the what are the inner workings of the Brazilian in oil industry and, and maybe a historic perspective and so on and so forth. So without without more uh, wait, I'll leave you with Eloisa for the for the for for for, for, for her presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Rodrigo, and thank you all for inviting me. May I give? Hello. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. I'll just uh, I'll give you a spoiler. The Brazilian oil industry history. It's nothing like the Norwegian. It's a tale of you know learned lessons and and how can we do better over time. Okay. And just a quick uh, explanation. What's the Energy Research Office? It's a government-owned company uh, linked to the Brazilian Ministry of Mines and Energy. That's why originally uh, you reached the Brazilian Mines and Energy Ministry, and they 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 suggested that I did the this presentation because. Mm -hmm. What we do is to provide information, studies, and research to support the planning and the development of energy policy measures. And our expertise areas cover oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear, renewables, electricity, energy efficiency. Now we're starting to, to study hydrogen. Of course, it's different uh, directors. Yeah, it's not everything with me. But the idea is that the Energy Research Office looks at energy in a kind of integrated way. Okay. So a brief history of the Brazilian oil industry. Like uh, I'll start with a journey towards our first oil. Uh, the first grant in Brazil was granted in 1864 by Imperial Decree. Uh, no oil was discovered, but you know the knowledge at the time indicated that there should be onshore uh, resources in Brazil. So it was in the region of Camamu, Bahia. It's still a, a producing basin, and the first since the first constitution, Brazil already uh, regulated the hydrocarbon uh, exploration. First, it tied underground mineral resources ownership to land ownership, a system that's similar to the United States. And no discoveries were made under this regime. In 34, a new constitution was uh, published and the resources started to be owned, controlled and managed by the, by the state. The first refinery started in 37. The National Petroleum Council that later became the National Energy Policy Council was created in 38. And in 39, finally, we had our first dis oil discovery. There was like this huge uh, uh, effort, public effort uh, to try to discover oil. And the name of this uh, specific field and the uh, well, it's called Lobato. And there's a, a, a story that's actually a children's book called um, The Well of the Viscount by a very famous Brazilian children's author called Monteiro Lobato. He wrote uh, several uh, books that are still read nowadays in Brazil for kids. And he has this specific story. It was like this huge, uh, you know, uh, effort. And that's why the, 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 call, the they call it Lobato. And in 41, we had our first commercial, commercial discovery. And then we started a, a, a national campaign uh, that was called O Petróleo Nos, the oil is ours. And in 53, Petro, Petrobras was created. Up until then, it's not that we didn't have oil, we had resources, as I said, since the last century, there were, you know, indicate there were signals that we had hydrocarbons, especially in the onshore basins. Brazilian government had hired this huge uh, 
geological campaign and lots of experts from the United States came to Brazil and they did uh, a research and they came to the conclusion that Brazilian only had uh, at the knowledge at the time only had uh, onshore uh, potential and the president at the time, which was Getulio Vargas, the guy in the, in the picture over there, he, he didn't accept. He decided to nationalize everything, create a state monopoly, and, and you know, use that state monopoly to, to push forward the Brazilian uh, uh, exploration. It started with exploration ENP, refining and transportation, but very shortly it was extended to crude oil and petroleum imports. And by the end of that uh, period, in the end of in the middle 60s, 60s, Brazilian oil production reached 100,000 barrels per day. It was not much, but it was already more than the, the original geologic campaign said that we could reach. Uh, in 68, Petrobras did its first offshore discovery in shallow waters in Sergipe. Sergipe is still a producing state as well and still has, it's one of the main drivers that we see for the next decade, uh, actually. Uh, in 74, we started to discover oil in Campus Basin. And then in 75, uh, around the 70s, it was clear that Petrobras would need partners uh, to further uh, move towards at its um, uh, ambitions. So in 75, we had risk service contracts that allowed the federal government uh, to contract with some companies. The idea was to attract international companies. Uh, it, didn't, it, it didn't work out for several reasons. Most of them, and later we understood, so most, some of it was the, the specific, you know, the, 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 the economic and geopolitical moment, especially for the oil industry, but some of it was something that we later explored was that companies, most oil companies, it's in their core business to operate. So usually whenever we tried to, to keep them from, from operatorship, like as just partners, uh, keep them uh, apart from uh, operational decisions, that did not bode well. Uh, you know, uh, of course there are partnerships and not all companies operate all fields all the time, but it became clear that uh, for international oil companies, it's essential that they can, they are able to operate their own fields. By 84, we had more than 5,000 barrels per day. So uh, it, 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 at some point, especially the campus basin started to prove a very, a very productive basin. I would remind you that in the 60s, we had around 100,000 barrels a day. Uh, 84, we, we had, uh, in the 80s, we had 200,000 barrels a day. By 84, we had 500. Then we discovered our first, first giant fields, which were Albacora, Albacora and Marlin. And both Albacora and Marlin are still producing fields and they, uh, they, Petrobras is still investing to revamp them. And, and they, they have now pre-salt reservoirs. So those, both, both of those fields are still very important in Brazil. They, they, they had like 25 years and 20 more to go. By the end of the 90s, uh, it was clear that we needed, uh, and not only on the oil industry, Brazilian economy needed uh, a series of reforms, including energy sector. And in 95, we had a constitutional amendment that ended with Petrobras mon monopoly on oil activities. Uh, with that amendment, it's important to, to point out that there was lots of concerns in, the, in that time, in the beginning of the market opening with uh, what to do with Petrobras. Uh, we didn't want to breach Petrobras 
contracts or rights or forfeit its investments. The idea was to attract more investments. So what the national ANP, the national regulator D, was we had what we call a round zero. So ANP sit with Petrobras and negotiated which fields Petrobras was already operating and producing. They had contracts for that. Those are what we call in Brazil round zero contracts to guarantee Petrobras rights. And the, the, the areas that Petrobras was already exploring, already had some investment done it got to keep that, but then under um, contracts that you know had a time frame for exploration. And then that was 97, 98, we had the round zero contracts. In 99, we had our first bidding round. And uh, we had several companies that came to Brazil. If you look, in the first, in the results of the first bidding round, uh, you have several big companies, middle companies, independent uh, oil operators, and uh, but over time, most of them then they came and then they went. I'll, I'll explain later why. And but the majors they got results really fast. So. After the market opening, Shell was the first uh, company to begin oil production uh, in the Bijukirai Salema fields, also in Campos Basin. By then, Brazil already had a million barrels per day of oil production. And we kept going. You know, we had round one, round two, round three, round four. In 2007, Petrobras announced a huge discovery. You know, we, we were, I'll, I'll show you the numbers. We were, we had a steady uh, uh, oil production curves, a steady growth, a very impressive growth in production, investments, especially investments in exploration, well, uh, uh, in new wells, so on and so forth. By 2009, Brazil had 2 million barrels per day of oil production. Most of that, our uh, diagnostic is that it helped to, uh, how can I say, to, to, to allow Petrobras to keep what it could, but to, but to recognize, and that's what we say up until now, that Brazil is greater than one company. So all the investment that we needed could not possibly be done by one company, and by keeping it exclusively with Petrobras, we were, we were actually capping the oil industry in Brazil uh, development. So uh, the idea was that the, the investments grew. Petrobras had a tremendous amount of success because Petrobras was very clever in its partnerships, clever in a good way. Uh, the company was able to take the most and to take very positive lessons from the partnerships and the, the, the partners were able to put the needed amount of money. Not every field had Petrobras as operator, but Petrobras was still the main operator of uh, most areas in Brazil. Uh, Petrobras announced to P, but it kept. There's a, there's lots of lots and lots of presentations telling the specific story of the pre-salt. Petrobras uh, discovered the pre-salt formation, but it didn't have the technology to explore it. It just uh, it kept uh, insisting, and in 2009, it had an extended well test into P, and it was proved the potential of the pre-salt, not only that the pre-salt, uh, you know, was a, a, a producing basin, a good play, but it was a terrific play. And then we had a, you know, a famous uh, uh, picture, you know, the president was there and he has his hand with the oil. What happened was that when Petrobras announced to be Brazilian government decided it might be a good idea to change the exploration regime. The idea was that the pre-salt uh, reservoirs, 
had, were very productive. They had high productivity. I don't know if that's the word in English and a low risk. So uh, there was, you know, this intense debate committees were created and the Brazilian government proposed a new uh, legal framework for the oil and gas industry and established the production sharing regime inside what we call the pre-salt polygon. I'll just make, make clear because uh, the pre-salt polygon, actually it's not the same as the pre-salt you know, geological place. We have the geological pre-salt uh, outside the legal polygon uh, a lot, but the law at that time you know, designs a specific area in the Brazilian offshore uh, basins. And inside that area, uh, there, there was a mandatory production sharing regime and the only operator would be Petrobras with a minimum interest of 30%, but it could ask for 100%. Uh, also, because some fields were already discovered and Petrobras needed the money, needed to, the capital to, to, to explore the pre-salt and the huge areas it had discovered, uh, Brazil established a specific regime that came, you know, became very famous again last year, which was the transfer of rights regime. It's not a, a production sharing contract, it's something similar to a concession lease, but it was not granted through a bidding round or through a competitive uh, process. It was a direct contract between the Brazilian government and Petrobras. And since those areas already had proven reserves because we had wells there, if you look in the ANP web maps, we have uh, wells ANP1 and ANP2, ANP uh, drilled the agency uh, uh, commissioned a company to drill two wells to prove the reserves. And so we had a contract a lot transferring to Petrobras. Uh, it was 10 areas later, you know, they moved on and forth and they result, but originally we had 10 fields and Petrobras had the right to uh, produce up to 5 billion barrels of oil equivalent in that areas. Uh, I'll come back to that later, but just to give a spoiler that you almost know, uh, it ended up that those, those areas had far more than 5 billion barrels. Now we believe that they have at least 12 to 15 billion barrels of oil equivalent. So we had, we have, you know, more oil there than the contracted and we had to uh, auction it again. Uh, but then we had this specific framework and the Brazilian government decided not to act auction Campos and Santos Basin again. So the following uh, bidding rounds, they were concentrated in new exploratory frontiers. So we had Sergipe Lagoas, we had the Ecuador margin, but we refrained from um, from offering Campos and Santos Basin. One of the explanations was that uh, the Brazilian government at the time wanted to diversify the industry to uh, give incentives for companies to invest in other states uh, within, the, within Brazil in order to try to attract you know, benefits for other areas because there was a, a political vision that only the states of Rio, São Paulo, and Spit Santo were actually benefiting from the oil industry. Uh, in 2013, there was a discovery of the Buzios field in the Santos Basin, but that was already uh, contracted with Petrobras. And we had the first uh, uh, PSC bidding round and we granted only one area, the Libra area. The idea was that uh, it had also a, a very uh, promising reservoir. And the winning consortium was the only one that showed, there was only one offer. 
led by Petrobras with Shell Total and both the Chinese companies, uh, Sinopec and Sinop. Uh, that one of the main uh, controversies of that first bidding round was that uh, Brazilian government, uh, some, some companies thought that the, the signature bonds was too high. It was 15 billion reais at the time, with the dollar at the time was something around seven to eight billion dollars. And some companies saw it as, uh, you know, lot of, lots of risk. So we had no competition. Also in 2013, uh, we had another federal company created just to oversee the production for PS for production sharing contracts and to, to commercialize the crude oil that Brazil got in, the, in that contracts because the production sharing contracts, I don't know if it's common knowledge, should have said before. So quick explanation, uh, in concession leases, usually you grant the right to explore and, and you know, produce oil uh, at the company's own risk. And they pay, usually they pay uh, a signature bonus not mandatory, lots of countries do not require signature bonus. They commit to a minimum investment and uh, afterwards they pay, you know, whatever taxes and royalties uh, are applicable in the specific country. In production sharing contracts, it's not usual that companies pay a signature bonus, but it's not unusual as well. You know, it's, you may do it. And, but the main characteristic of this kind of contract is that the government is a partner of the company, not a, a paying partner, it doesn't pay uh, for investments, but the structure of those kinds of, of contracts is that uh, you take the total amount of oil produced, you take off the costs, so what you call cost oil in this kind of contracts, you take off the cost oil from the remaining oil, not the value, but oil itself. You split the remaining oil between the companies and the government in, uh, in what we call the, I forgot the name, excedente oil in Portuguese. It's uh, the oil, it's not accident, I remember. I remember the, Oversupply? Sur huh? Oversupply? It's not a, so in, in Portuguese, the name would be excedente, uh, alíquota de excedente in oil. It's the share of the oil oversupply that you pay to the government. Uh, there's a specific legal name that I just forgot, but I'll remember. And it's, it's one of the later slides. But the idea is that the remaining oil is split between the government and the company. So the the government in production sharing contracts, what you get is the actual oil. And then later you have to sell this oil in the international market. And uh, that's PPSA's job. You know, it's a federal company that actually you know, holds uh, bids and, and competitive process for uh, selling the Brazilian oil. In 2016, the pre-salt oil production alone reached 1 million barrels per day. Uh, but by then, and I'll show you uh, uh, a slide afterwards, we figured out it was very clear that we had a problem, not with pre-salt. Pre-salt was great, pre-salt was doing spectacularly, but we had lost investments in all, other area, uh, all the other areas. The time it took the Brazilian government to decide the new legal framework, it was five years that we had no new areas contracted. It was having effects, it had effects in our exploratory activity. So we had the post-salt and the onshore production with very deep declines. We have some we had, you know, we have no ex new exploratory wells. And if it was not for the result, Brazil would, would be really bad. So the Brazilian government started to think about it. Uh, how can we keep the result, but, you know, uh, get everything else on track? And then 
uh, we had new legal and regulatory changes. The first one was that in the result, in the PSC agreements, Petrobras had the right, but not the obligation to be operator of all fields. So now, uh, and that's actually what's in debate now to change, but uh, between that time, Petrobras had the right to nominate if it wanted to operate or not. And usually it was clear that, you know, Petrobras could not operate everything. So we started having uh, areas inside the pre-salt being granted to other companies. We also had a bidding round calendar other thing that was very clear to us is that when a company come to the, comes to the country, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't look at one, you know, only one, uh, uh, one project. It must have a, 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 a project, you know, long-term sustainability in that country. In order to do that, it was necessary that we establish a bidding round calendar so that companies could plan their their growth inside the countries you know so uh sometimes one only one project was not enough you know didn't sustain the 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 strategy most companies strategy so establishing a bidding round calendar that was not dependent on you know political decisions like before it uh it was actually before i started working with bidding rounds because I went to that area specifically in 2016. But uh, before, you know, it was something like, oh, you, you had to get a meeting with the ministry, and then you tried to get a feeling whether or not there was going to be a bidding round and when it was going to, to, to happen. Because, you know, you have to plan your budget, you have to plan your incremental, uh, you have to plan your portfolio. And, and the bidding round calendar was very positive in, in, in you know, allowing companies to plan their uh, uh, investment budgets, uh, plan their portfolio, and look forward, you know, in, in middle, middle, medium and long term uh, 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 strategies to grow and to invest in Brazil. And also we had what we, we call, and I'll explain later, an open, open acreage system. The idea of the open acreage is that companies, you know, the, 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 the blocks are there and companies, they can study at their own pace. And whenever they're ready, they can nominate uh, a specific sector and they can tell a and okay, I'm interested in, that, in this sector and they, they, they nominate it. And then a &P has three months to hold a competitive session. Under Brazilian law, uh, you cannot grant concession leases directly to companies. You must have a, a competitive session, a public session with open envelopes, you know, where you open and it's very public, transmitted in the internet. Uh, so, but the, the compromise that the, the government did was that uh, everything would be done in three months. So if the company showed interest in three months, they have their lease, but they have to, they, they still have to compete for it. Brazil revealed our local content policy at the time, and I'll show uh, uh, in the request, you requested specifically about the local content. So I'll show slides specifically on that. It was also a learning process. We started with some rules. Uh, I think we, we overreached and the local content, content requirements was, were too high. And in 2016 and 17, Brazil had to review it. And in mature fields, Brazil started to, uh, to reduce uh, royalties, but afterwards, not only for mature fields, uh, up until 2016, Brazil had a flat 10% royalty uh, fee. It, it was only 10%. Uh, then it started for mature and marginal fields. It lowered to 5%. And to some, for some new exploratory areas with high, high risk, 
we started fixing the, the royalty uh, tax in 5%, 7%, you know, lower than the, the original 10% that was uh, applicable until then. Also, Petrobras started to its, its disinvestment program. It was not a federal uh, decision. Actually, I think it's public. You know, Petrobras uh, had lots of problems with its uh, debt, and it went over a very, very public and, and you know, famous investigation regarding corruption in Brazil. It's called a car wash operation. And the, the effects, one of the effects of uh, the corruption and the use of Petrobras for political uh, measures was that the company was in great debt. So it had to reevaluate its portfolio and it started a process, process of strategic repositioning. Uh, under the Labour Party government, Petrobras uh, went you know, to everything. <coughs> I'm sorry, Petrobras started to invest a lot, even in, in areas that were not the company's main expertise. And starting from 2016, the company uh, decided to review that strategy, and mainly disinvesting in oil and gas production, uh, a portfolio that did not fit the size of the company. So, you know, a company that was operating in the pre-salt with wells that by them, you know, in the pre-salt we have wells that produce 60,000 barrels per day. And the, that same company had to operate small onshore fields with 10 barrels per day, but you know, nine were water and only one was oil. It didn't make sense. It was not uh, economic for the size of the company. So the company started to disinvest mainly in onshore and shallow water, in, in shallow water, aiming specifically in the, in the, what we tried to do was to emulate what we saw in the North Sea, you know, with the brownfields uh, recovery and uh, that's the main strategy for shallow water. Oh, that was history. What were, are we now? And recently, what did we do? We do. Well, Brazil uh, GDP it's 1.84 trillion dollars, the ninth largest economy in the world. I have to say that uh, some uh, economic projections show that because of the Brazilian exchange rate and the impacts of the COVID crisis. Brazil will probably lose that position. We'll go to 11 or 12 to lose that ranking. And the oil and gas is the third largest economy activity in Brazil. It's uh, the largest is still the agribusiness. Well, foreign direct investment in Brazil was $75 billion in 2019. Most of it came to the oil industry, and that was the fourth largest uh, for direct investment attraction in the world. Uh, we have 50,000 companies and more than 400,000 jobs directly related to the oil and gas sector. And it is now the largest sector in tax revenue in Brazil. Well, Brazil is also the ni ninth largest oil production in the world, the largest in Latin America, 10 years ago, that was like unthinkable. Of course, our, uh, you know, at that position, it's also reflects some other countries decline. Uh, we have, you know, Mexico and Venezuela uh, have, have lost a lot of production, but it's still, uh, it's, imagine, it was unimaginable 10 years ago. But we are also the seventh largest consumer of petroleum product, products. And I would like to point out the R&D investor. Oil and gas sector is the largest spender in R&D in Brazil. We are the ninth, ninth highest in the world. 
And that's mainly because there's specifically clause in the oil and gas contracts where uh, R&D investment is mandatory. So you have to invest 1% of your uh, total revenue in R&D expenditure. And from that 1%, 0.5 the company can invest uh, you know inside the company in their in their own labs but 0.5 percent they have to invest in you know Brazilian universities and research institutes I will show you later but that's a lot of money like by 2030 it will mean like five billion reais it's it's a lot of investment for uh, our universities it was a, a very good policy uh almost, almost half of our primary energy supply comes for oil and gas in brazil but we also have a very high percentage of renewables renewables especially i don't know if you're aware in the electric sector brazil has a huge hydropower plants uh cap capacity cap um, capacity but we also have solar and wind, especially in the northeast part of Brazil. So um, that's what accounts for so much renewables in our primary energy supply uh, matrix. What we have now, we have uh, 40 sedimentary basins with oil and gas, 25% of them are onshore and 15 offshore. Uh, we have currently 270 exploratory blocks under concession and 300 producing fields, most of them onshore. We have 74 in development, which is, you know, something in between exploration. They already have commercial discovery, but the development plan is not yet approved. Most of the fields are onshore, but most of the production is offshore here. I, uh, there's a, a, a highlight for the pre-salt. As I said, it's not, we have, you know, pre-salt outside the polygon, but the, the pre-salt area is the, the blue one. And if you look, uh, we have lots of blocks, you know, in the, right in the frontier, because that's a very attractive area as well. Uh, Brazil has 12, almost 13 billion barrels of, proving reserves, most of them offshore, but we still think there's a lot of potential onshore and the open acreage aims to, to try to take advantage of that. Uh, most of our natural gas is offshore as well. Those are the main production fields. We have the Solimões Basin. Here it's mainly natural gas and uh, we have producing fields, but we also have some uh, interesting prospects. And they here we have, you know, a, a challenge, which is uh, producing oil and gas um, inside the, the Amazon forest. There's lots of environmental concerns and, and uh, you know, requirements here. The Parnaíba Basin, also uh, gas, natural gas, mainly basin. And here we have very uh, interesting solutions to gas to wire, you know, lots of thermal power plants in order to use this specific gas. Why I'm pointing out that, what I'm trying to, to say is that it's interesting to see that each basin like has its own characteristics and it was one of the lessons that the Brazilian government had to, to learn, you know, a one size fits all solution would not allow us to explore all the possibilities. So we had to try to adapt. Potiguar, uh, and here in the Northeast, we have onshore and offshore, but basically Potiguar, Potiguar Reconcavo and Espírito Santo onshore are still producing basins, but they are declining. So the Brazilian government had a specific program to, to try to uh, to try to change that. Sergipe Alagoas Basin offshore here, it's a very promising basin. We have light oil and natural gas discovery, significant ones. 
And here we have speed to sound to campus and centers, which, which are now the main, you know, high potential production basins in Brazil. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the graph I talked about, you know, we started here, then we, we, we plateaued here, and then after the 95, when we opened the industry, we started a very successful cycle. I think that's one of the messages, and the other one is that was, it's very, very interesting to see that the, at the time, there was we had lots and lots of uh, concerns by some segments of the Brazilian society that the opening would be harmful to Petrobras. And, you know, lot, most of the Brazilian people are very proud of Petrobras. And what actually happened was that it was very, very good for the company. It, the company grow, grew, grew, the company grew with the oil and gas sector. And the natural gas gross production also increased a lot. Uh, well, but now we have, as I said, our onshore production is falling a lot. And if this graph was split between offshore pre-salt and offshore conventional offshore, uh, I have a, another one that shows that you know, we would see that what's saving the Brazilian production is the pre-salt. What we learned is that we have three different uh, environments and we have to adapt and, and be able to, to, to have different solutions for each one of them. So we have the onshore with lots of produ producing wells, but each one of them, you know, very, they, they, they have lots of water, and they have you no, know, it's only the average oil production per well, it's 11 barrels per, per day. And so we, it's, there's a challenge here. We have the conventional offshore, which is good. We have 400 wells, average oil production around 2000 barrels per day, but declining. And we have the, 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 the pre-salt, with 100 wells with an average oil production of 18, almost 19 barrels per day. But as I pointed out, we have some wells here with very high perform performance. Uh, we have wells that reach 60,000, 65,000 barrels per day and have to be kept because of you know, operational security uh, uh, criteria because they actually have to be kept, if not, who knows how much it would produce. Uh, I don't know if, you, if you're aware of the, if you've seen this graph before, uh, I talked about the pre-salt, but the, the pre-salt was a very, uh, a very important discovery regarding, you know, uh, the engineering and geological part, part of the uh, oil and gas industry knowledge. Uh, Brazil has been, uh, on, for, for a long time, Brazil has been uh, has been on the technological journey for deep water. What we did was move towards deep waters, um, and the pre-salt we had to develop specific technology for that because we have large accumulations with ex excellent quality, uh, but you know with characteristics of pressure and reservoirs that were challenging at the time. So we had to develop it in, uh, new technologies and work in collaboration with the universities and research centers. That's a very good lesson that we learned. Uh, of course, one could argue that the result itself could not be foreseen, but uh, only through the research and development clause, we were able to enhance the university's capability to develop the technology. So uh, it was a very, a very successful measure because we had the, the, the research centers that were able to develop the technology we need to explore the result. So, as I said, Brazilian uh, oil and gas history, it's also a history of development, developing technology to go towards uh, offshore deep water. 
the first field got open was a, very, a shallow water uh, discovery. But if you see the, 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 the depth of the field was already, you know, 3,000 3, meters. But then we kept moving to Marlin and then Marlin Sun, Roncador, Tupi. Uh, Tupi, it's 300 kilometers away from the Brazilian shore. We have 2,000 meters of water and then 5,000 meters, you know, of rock. And now we already have Iracema Sul, which is, you know, uh, farther, it's farther away. And it's also go uh, more, uh, more deep. Those are, here's the salt. Those are the reservoirs. As I said, some, some fields like Marlin and Marlin Sul, now Petrobras is trying to reach those reservoirs here. Uh, uh, below the, the the salt because they have uh, explored the post salt reservoirs, but they think so. Lot and that's the case for a lot of Brazilian uh, producing fields. You know now the the in the Campos and Santos Basin they are trying to explore if it's possible to go deeper. And this is just a schematic of what we have. As I said, here's the state. So see, by some, you know, geological, geographic uh, uh, reason, most of it is in front of three states, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Espírito Santo. So there's a lot of political issue regarding why only those states and those municipalities should uh, you know, take the, the benefit or receive the benefit of the oil and gas uh, industry. And those are the, we have, I, I, I marked here, those are the transfer of rights surplus that we had last year, 16 pigeon round also last, last year. Here is the six uh, production sharing pigeon round also last year. And the green ones and the brown ones are the future areas that should be auctioned this year and the next one and were you know wrote so 17 will be 2021 and 18th bidding round will, will go to 2022. Uh, well what we did also was try to adapt our contracting uh, rules to, to the different environments so in the pre-salt, we have the production sharing and the transfer of rights. Everything else is a concession, but both the production sharing and the concession must be uh, granted through bidding rounds. And what the open acreage is kind of a, a innovative bidding round to try to know to 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 give more flexibility to the to the to the contracting procedures. Recently, what happened? We saw that uh, we had lots done, but then in the second half of the 2010 uh, decade, the Brazilian oil industry was struggling. You know, we had a huge success, and then with the oil prices crash, we started to 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 to, to have difficulties. We had, uh, uh, you know, very few wells concluded. As you can see here, we came from 600 wells in 2015 to 250 in 2016 and going down. We had, you know, very, lots of companies leaving at its exploratory activities. So here we have the exploration concluded wells going down but that reflects the fact that companies were leaving the country. So we had lots of companies that came to Brazil after the, the, the opening that were going away. On the other hand, you know, the pre-salt was doing great and the post-salt production was declining. We had a 60% decline in the decade and the Northeast basins, you know, the Sergipe Alagoas that I said, it's, you know, very promising basins. 
also declining, 75% uh, decline in oil production. So uh, Brazilian government started to try to uh, get, attract back, you know, take back the exploration investments and try to revitalize activities uh, aiming specifically in maximizing a recovery factor. The idea is that the potential is still to explore, even with the success of the pre salt we have very, very low recovery factors. If we see campus base in 15%, uh, the current ones, if you consider the development plans, it might reach 23%. Uh, the average in Brazil is 21% of recovery factor when the world is still uh, it, it's has on average 35 recovery factor. If we look at the North Sea, we have fields with up to 60% recovery factor. We saw that we were leaving lots of oil, you know, above ground, underground, sorry. We, have, we, we were leaving lots of oil underground and we were actually, you know, not exploring our full potential. So if we could just increase here, not only we could uh, explore new areas, but we could, you know, uh, uh, better use the areas we already have. 1% addition of recovery factor in the campus basin, it, it's almost a billion, a billion barrels of oil equivalent of new reserves. So it's a lots of lots of potential that you know we were missing. What we did in 2016, Petrobras was no longer the sole operator of the pre-salt area. I already said that Brazil established a multi-year bid round calendar, and we have a set of new ENP policies. It's a resolution from the National Council of uh, Energy Policy, uh, setting very specific goals and mandates to the regulatory agency and to the Brazilian Energy Mines and Ministry. And also it has mandate, you know, we have, uh, we had to establish uh, indicators and measure those indicators, how our reserves, how our, you know, our production. Uh, we had also a new local content policy and the Repetro. Repetro is a specific fiscal regime for the oil and gas industry. And it was going to end in 2017. So the, the idea the Brazilian government, after lots and lots of discussion, decided to extend the, the, the Repetro. Most of uh, our uh, existing investments would not be economic if that had not happened. Also, the, this, this same resolution created the open acreage and uh, we decided to reduce royalties and we regulated reserve-based lending, which is a financial instrument that allows company to, to, to grant its exploratory rights as a guarantee for you know, a financial uh, loan. Before, it was not possible because the, the reservoir underground it's not it's not the company's property what the company has is the right to explore and produce and it only gets the oil after it's produced so it was not possible under the Brazil to grant this the the reservoir itself as a guarantee for the financial institutes uh, that that happens in the United States in Canada it's one of the ways they got you know to to to, to make lots and lots of investments in the, in the uh, United States, North America, onshore production. That's how companies were able to get funds to invest in so many wells, because uh, when we talk about hydraulic fracturing, you know, you, you have to, you know, have to keep, keep drilling, keep drilling. So, so lots of capital expenditure. Uh, that's how they in the North, in North America they solved that that equation through reserve based lending that was not possible in Brazil up until last year. The calendar established in 2017 
We had three bidding rounds in 2017, three bidding rounds in 2018, four bidding rounds in 2019. And I must say, since I was super bidding round superintendent, in 2019, I unfortunately ended up that year in the ICU. I was totally burnt out, but it was a success for the company. In 2020, we started uh, only the open acreage. All bidding rounds were suspended because of the COVID crisis. And the Brazilian government recently decided to, to postpone and to have the seventh bidding round in 2021, 18th bidding round in 2022, and the other bidding rounds are still to be defined. I'll talk about that later, because one of the things that the Brazilian government is considering now is to uh, forfeit the production sharing regime, so uh, to contract only under concession. What's the open acreage? The idea of the open acreage is that you have you know, a set of companies uh, uh, register only once for life. For life, no, but you know, the, they register only once and they don't have to keep registering every year. Uh, they pay a very, very low registry fee for that. It's 2,050 Brazilian reais. It's like in, let me see, it's $500. And you have access to 27 uh, sectors in the Brazilian sedimentary basin. The sedimentary basins, they are split in, in different sectors. And so the idea is that companies may register and they evaluate the areas that are there. Nowadays, we have around 700 blocks. And if companies decide that they, they, they are interested, they declare, they, they declare this interest and then we have this interest and we have a public session. Everything here, here, no deadline, you know, companies can do at their own time. From a declaration of interest to the public section, we have 90 days. Uh, in the first cycle that was last year, companies uh, showed interest in 273 blocks, but the, the final award were 33 blocks and 12 uh, fields with marginal accumulations. Most of them onshore, but we had three offshore contracts that were granted to Exxon and it's uh, the consortium was led by Exxon, but we have Murphy, Exxon, and Alta was the partnership, if I'm not mistaken. It, both of uh, the three of them in the Sergipe Alagoas Basin. The second cycle that was now, companies showed interest in analyzing over 700 exploratory blocks, most of them onshore, but we have lots of interest in the offshore basins, including uh, Campus Deepwater and Santos Deepwater. And the public session for presenting offers for this cycle will be held in December 4th. That's the results of the three years after we changed the regulation uh, it was not only that, we all, uh, I must say it was not in the slide, but also reviewed, we, we, we did a very thorough review of the contracts, you know, uh, we, we, we took everything that companies had already said, we, we tried to see it and see what was not working, for instance, the exploratory phase in Brazil, uh, we had a first, a first exploratory phase, a second one, each one with mandatory investments. In the second one, you had to, to, to drill at least one well. Uh, the idea was that we join them and the minimal, there's only a minimal exploratory program that's very, very low and companies can do whatever they want for offshore areas. It's seven years, so they have a seven year exploratory phase. Uh, they can do they, they have to tell a and P what they're planning to do, but you know they can explore whatever they want. And by the end of it, they had to decide if they want to uh, declare commercially that they, they, they want to you know 
move on to, to evaluating the discovery or if they give back. So the contract, it was the idea, it was a, it's now less bureaucratic. And some of the, 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 the clauses that were very, very uh, key to investors, like the arbitration clause, uh, we did a lot and lots of homework. You know, we, we went to the attorney general office and we went to the international conference to try to understand how could we improve the arbitration clause and we reviewed everything. So uh, besides the, the, the legal changes, we also had lots and lots of changes in the contracts that were perceived as uh, good for the companies. The bidding round, so we had more than uh, 130 awarded blocks with signing bonus that were, you know, uh, enhancing a lot. And I did not put here the transfer of rights because it would, uh, it's so, you know, it's a, so off the charts that wouldn't fit. But the signing bonus, the total signing bonus was 300, uh, $30,000. $30 billion. And I would point out that only next, last year we had $17 billion of uh, signing bonus. And the minimum investment, as I said, not many requirements because it's really minimum. Uh, the idea is that com if the area is attractive, companies will uh, invest and explore by themselves. So there's no need for us to to require you know, huge uh, amounts of investment because they will naturally do it. So that has changed the exploratory map of the Sunset Campus Basin. That's 2016, that's June 2020. And also not only we changed the map, but you see now we have uh, lots, of diff lots of different operators in that area. And a very important change was our lo local content. Our local content policy was a, a, it's a tale of, you know, a learning. It was always there. We started uh, with uh, no specific requirements, but companies, uh, their, the local content offer had 15% weight in the award criteria and you had specific items that if you had if you compromise if you if you decided to to compromise with those specific items you get a bonus in the public section award that was for the fourth fourth for the the, the first four bidding rounds then we we enhance the weight of the awarding criteria and here it was a disaster because when we did that, every company decided to beat a hundred percent local content. If they had, like, if they could, they would beat a hundred twenty, a hundred fifty percent. So uh, that was a, from a public policy point of view, it was a disaster because we ended up with lots of contracts that were not, you know, able were were impossible. To, to, to fulfill. And then we learned, we decided to uh, reduce the weight in the award criteria, but then the Brazilian government did, a, did something that learn, later, we, we learned that was not a very good decision. We decided to, to only allow companies to bid in specific items. So if you look at the, 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 the contract at the time, it's a huge table with 90 specific items with caps, you know, you have maximum, maximum and minimum local content for each specific items. And you had to meet the requirements in each item and in global level. So it's a, it was a very complicated policy. And we, in order to establish the maximum and minimum amounts the Brazilian government did a, you know, the, it tried to foresee how would our local industry evolve. So it expected 
us to be able to have local industries that would meet, would be able to, 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 to provide for these goods and services, and that did not happen. So, you know, by, by 2014, we, we had a, a, a lots of contracts that it was impossible to beat the local contract requirements. And they were very, very, very complicated. They were complicated to regulate, to, 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 uh, to, to fiscalize. So in to, starting 2014, 15, 16, we had no bidding rounds. In 2017, as I said, the uh, Energy Policy Council decided to change the rule and we came back now, uh, the local contract, it's no longer a uh, award criteria. Companies cannot bid on that. It's a contract obligation on global levels. So uh, now we have uh, requirements here. Now uh, we have, uh, you know, 20% uh, requirements for, for exploratory phase. 40% for the production phase. It's, I, 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 I thought I had this right in details, but it's, it's simpler for the regulator and it's more feasible for the companies. Of course, we had complaints by the, the, the industry, the local industry, because they wanted higher percentages but the, the idea was that we were trying to learn from, the, from our previous mistake. Uh, the production share bidding rounds, uh, the local content was never an award criteria, it, but it also had you know, minimum requirements for exploration and the uh, development phases. Those are just, I can leave the slides with you. Those are just a detail on which are the rules and which the weight and how to evidence that you have met the requirements. So uh, now Brazil has a system of local content certificates. So certifying entities accredited by a &P, they go there, they, go, uh, they, they do a very you know, detailed evaluation and they give the company a local content certificate. The company gets that certificate and presents it to a &P. That's the, the average that was offered in concession bidding rounds. As I said, when we, when we made it 40% a, a, a of the award criteria, we had very, very high bids here in round four and, and five. And after that, it was basically because the minimum and the maximum, you know, they were already high. And the, so in the average in bidding rounds, we had uh, for around 37, 40 for exploration and 55 for development. But as you see, for the following bidding rounds here, PSC3 and PSC4 specifically, that was not, uh, our criteria, that's a fixed obligation the contract. Round 14 is the same. <clears throat> oh, that's the slide I wanted. Now we have for onshore 50% minimal local content requirement. Very easily, be easily achievable. Most onshore activities reach 100%. And for offshore, we have 18% in exploration and development. You have groups for wells, subsea, and platforms. However, in the first phase, when you have very detailed criteria, uh, companies could ask for waivers. Uh, you know, they could prove that it was not possible to meet that requirement and a &P could grant a waiver of the local content obligation. Now, since those requirements are lower and they are only global requirements, there are no waivers possible. So companies must meet that requirement. They cannot uh, try to argue 
that it was not, not possible, there was no local industry, so on and so forth. Uh, our forecasts, we expect that basic, mostly, you know, with the recent developments, we expect to, to move from around, uh, around 3 million barrels per day. And by the end of the decade, we expect to be producing around 5.3 barrels, uh, million barrels per day. That's why the Brazilian ministry uh, foresees that Brazil by the end of the decade will be, uh, will be among the five uh, highest producing countries in the world. Uh, mainly the crude oil production, mainly it will be the pre-salt. We still think that the post-salt will you know, go down. We're trying to change that, but uh, you know, we still have to, to make it happen. And the main drivers of the growth that we foresee in the decade are those four fields. We have the bourgeois fields that you know, currently produce around uh, 600 barrels per day. And by 2030, only this specific field will produce around a million barrels per day. Uh, bourgeois field, it's uh, Petrobras and the transfer of rights surplus has the two, two Chinese companies in the consortium. The 2P field nowadays it produces 100 million barrels per day with the, you know, the normal decline of the field by the end of the decade, uh, with the existing development plan, it will be around, you know, 400 million, 4,000 million barrels, 4,000, 400,000 barrels per day. Metal field, uh, it's still under development, but, but it will reach 500,000 barrels per day. It's a consortium, it's a, a concession contract with Petrobras, Shell, Repsol, uh, Sinopec and Sinuc. And the SEPI field, it's a transfer of rights surplus field. Now it's still under development. Our ex we expect it to start producing next year. It will, it will reach the end of the decade with 400,000 barrels per day. So those four Few, four fields will be the main drivers of the Brazilian production by the end of the decade. Uh, we have currently 66 offshore oil platforms. And in order to meet all the investment requirements that companies have already committed with the Brazilian government, we have at least 39 new FPSOs uh, coming in the next decade. Uh, if we, we, we take into account those investments, especially the um, FPSOs, we expect around $400 billion of investments in the next decade. What we are doing in exploration, uh, we're still trying to uh, enhance our mature fields recovery and to advance in non-conventional exploration now there's a ban on non-conventional exploration in Brazil, mainly because we have uh, lots of uh, judicial decisions forbidding A and P to grant leases for non-conventional exploration. So there's still, uh, we still have lots of negotiation with environmental entities, the ministry, the public ministry of Brazil and the judiciary the judges, and uh, we see that we still need investment in operational support, especially the need for skilled labor, and we will need also uh, to increase our offshore support vessel fleet. That's, that's like a, a, a something that it, it came to our attention, so we have to invest in capacity to, to meet that requirement. And what we have for now, we have statistics, we have some initiatives to accelerate the pre-salt development. We want to improve the recovery factor in mature fields and advancing new frontiers. We don't want to keep owning the pre-salt. I just showed you that four fields will be responsible for most of the Brazilian production by the end of the decade. But you know, we want to, to look beyond that and for that, we have to advance to new frontiers. 
those new frontiers are basically Sergipe, Alagoas, and Camamu Almada in the northeast part of Brazil, and the equatorial margin of Brazil. And now uh, we have a policy of trying to attract the right players to each environment. So, you know, adapting contracts for onshore, offshore, marginal areas, having different contracts and different bidding rounds for different uh, environments. Specifically from the onshore, we have a program an initiative to revitalize the onshore exploration production. It has already started to, to have results. It's just that statistically, you know, when you compare it with the pre-solve, the results are, are still, uh, uh, you know, very, very low. But for instance, in this year, for fields that already uh, met the, the, the program, we have like 30% uh, uh, improvement in onshore production. So we have some very good uh, uh, results. It's just that the numbers are still very, uh, they're still pale when you compare with the pre -sol. That's the REACH program. We also have the new gas market, as I said, we have lots of uh, natural gas potential that's not being uh, explored. So we have a specific program for natural gas. And our goal is by the end of the decade, we have a, 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 a more uh, robust and competitive gas market in Brazil. And uh, we have a BDC, it's a third program. The idea is to enhance oil and gas exploration and production bids. Uh, the idea is to, uh, it started to enhance attractiveness and under evaluation is, you know, to, to end the production share regime and only contract under contraction to end the pre polygon or to, to evaluate Petrobras preferential rights to the operator. With the COVID crisis, the group, the scope of the group became bigger. And they also start, we also, because I'm uh, IP is in the group, we started to, to discuss, you know, to, to keep investments, what could we do to keep investments uh, in Brazil under this new scenario? Uh, so that's just, you know, saying what we did for each, uh, each different environment. And we, Places now in onshore, we are uh, ANP has just published a resolution that uh, its goal is to reduce royalties for small and medium sized oil companies. Uh, as a result of the COVID crisis and attract specialized mature field players in, in order to uh, enhance our recovery factor. So we are, we, we started to have specific policies, specific rules for each, uh, you know, we, in the beginning, it's one, one contract, one framework, one rule for all the environments. And one thing we've learned is that uh, we have to, to look at each one differently because it's different companies and different uh, situations. I'm sorry because I know I've, I've, I've gone way beyond my time. I promise I'm finishing. Uh, what the key takeaways are diversity and competition are the keys. Uh, as much companies we have, uh, uh, be the better the results. Previsibility creates attractive environments. So uh, not only previsibility in the rules, but the bidding round calendar, and having a, a regulatory uh, framework uh, uh, calendar, it, it's important. Acknowledging the, the importance of different rules for different environments, uh, being flexible in times of crisis because AMP had to, to, to give very fast responses to the COVID. And that's a, a lesson we learned by, from the local content. Stable rules are important but it's important to know when to improve them. So, you know, uh, uh, you, have to, you have to be open to realize that your 
policies might need improvements. And the challenge is, is to keep the national uh, production at the level predicted for 2030 and beyond. We don't want to reach a peak and then go down. We want to, you know, keep, keep going. To market the volumes of Brazilian oil and gas in an energy transition scenario, you know, the world is moving toward an energy transition that has two effects on the Brazilian energy policy. We have to hurry, you know, we have to, 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 to have urgency in our oil and gas industry because we might lose its timing, but also we have to be able to uh, make, to, to, to give incentives to our oil and gas industry move in an energy transition scenario. So how do we do that? We want to explore beyond the 200 uh, nautical miles. It's our next frontier. Beyond the pre-salt, now we are moving farther away from the Brazilian coast. There's a, a, a specific uh, international convention for, for that, and Brazil has been granted the right to move its uh, frontiers beyond the 200 nautical miles. So now we are going to in that area, but that it has a specific, you know, legal system with a royalty tax to be paid to the uh, international maritime uh, regulator. So it's a challenge. We want to develop our onshore basins and to review our fiscal models for strategic areas. I'm sorry it took me uh, longer than the first scene. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you so much. That was a very thorough presentation. <laughs> very, very good, thank you so much. So uh, we will move into, to, uh, into uh, to ask you some questions from, mostly from the public, if it's okay with you. Um, so let me take a few of them that we have them here. Uh, excuse me, let me see which one. Hmm. Yeah, this is very this is very interesting actually i would like to i, would, I, I like this question too um <clears throat> it's, it's from mr claudio claudio fonseca that's the name of the person who is asking the question so he's saying the following he's saying having brazil i mean given that brazil leads or is a leader in offshore technology and offshore exploration and, ex and offshore production in in latin america and you can argue in the world too uh, does Brazil have any strategy or any program uh, uh, or is it open in any way to share the, your experiences uh, and, uh, and maybe a research program or, or, or a collaboration program with other countries, especially maybe countries in the region? I mean, is there, is, is there something like that or that you know? Uh, I, I know of specific uh, interactions because that's done through the uh, Ministry of External Relations mm -hmm. but also we have a specific program with Inter, Inter, um, Inter American Development Bank okay starting an initiative called Energy Hub uh -huh. uh, and the idea is precisely to to share experiences and and publications and to mm -hmm. be you know a hub a knowledge hub and EPE, the company I'm, I'm part of, mm -hmm. the first entity in Brazil to join the Energy Hub. So we are, we are already uh, in, in negotiation with the Inter-American Development Bank. And the idea is to do that, you know, through the, the bank, because, uh, you know, since we don't have, uh, uh, we could do a, a cooperation, international cooperation in like three ways. We don't have nowadays like a, a policy for the latin america you know amongst the countries no convention mm -hmm. so by bilateral initiatives uh but now we are trying to advance through the inter-american development bank because since they they do projects with lots of you know individual countries they are trying to position them, themselves as a hub in order to do specifically that mm -hmm. experiences and knowledges and you know to connect 
everybody. Okay. Okay. And they just launched that initiative, like if I'm not mistaken, end of September or early October. It's a okay. pretty big one. And and the other question for Claudio is if it's Petrobras uh, willing to invest in pre-salt and other offshore basins and disinvesting onshore. I don't know if willing is the word. It's the current strategy of the company. Uh, mainly because the company's uh, positions in the onshore, they were not very effective or efficient in operator the onshore fields they have, but they, they, they didn't disinvest in everything. I mean, if you look, they kept some, some areas and in, in some fields, but the, their uh, strategy now is to focus on offshore. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and I, I have a question <clears throat> which is very interesting to me. I, I would like to, I mean, I think the, I mean, you, de you develop your industry, your offshore industry in particular, you develop it in partnership with international companies. That was a critical part of it. I mean, uh, I, 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 want, I once went to the Petrobras University in Rio and, and they gave me a presentation there about this and I can't remember I still can't remember that it was absolutely key element of the policy that you guys develop, you develop the Euro industry in partnership with the international companies. Uh, I mean, both uh, operators and also oil services companies. So, so and, uh, and you mentioned, in especially the last part of the presentation, the, the local content uh, laws or rules or how, however they are, is the right time for that. So, I mean, uh, I mean, overall, I think the I think the question answers itself. Oh, I mean, um, what were the key elements in the in establishing the relationship with the companies? I mean, you know, you decided that you will deal with these companies, but what were the key elements that were that were set up to say, okay, these are the guidelines or the main principles under which we will have a relationship with international companies? It's two to with the goal of achieving what you have now is that, that you have a, I mean, uh, Brazil is technologically very uh, active. I mean, you generate a lot of technology uh, and, that, and you sell it, of course. I mean, uh, so, uh, and, 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 and you, you, so you, you, you are the owner of that technology too. So you are, my point is that you are kind of on an equal, on an equal basis with international companies when it comes to technology. I mean, you can talk to them as a, not as a, no, that's, a, no, that's a, a, like as a, an inferior and superior partner. Is you are equal with to them. In, in, so how, how did you? Can you give us some main points on how that was achieved, please? Uh, I think I think the the the, the way the partnerships were uh, uh, constructed was important, and the, the the attention. That's why I pointed out in the R and D clause. Uh, that required companies to invest in Brazilian universe, Brazilian universities and research institutes. It was very important because we mm -hmm. have, you know, especially the deep water technology. It, 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 it isn't, of course, it, it isn't developed only in Brazil, but we have, as, as you, you pointed out, we have technology that was developed in Brazil and that was uh, very, very important. Yes, I saw that. Uh, uh, they're asking, they asking about it. Yes, yeah. UFRJ laboratories, mm -hmm. but not only UF, UFRJ was very, it was very good for the university because it actually became a hub. Uh, UFRJ has its own laboratories that were, you know, investments from the companies, but Petrobras has a research center in UFRJ. It belongs to Petrobras. It's mm -hmm. Sempes, Centro. Sempes, yes. Oh, yeah. The same is mm -hmm. it's a yeah. search of petroleum engineering center. Mm -hmm. They built a second one, so they doubled its center. So now we have Sampish one and Sampish two, and the the, the offshore uh, laboratories. We didn't we didn't request to invest in those laboratories specifically. Mm -hmm. the was that they had to invest in universities 
research uh, uh, institutes or service companies in Brazil. Yes, yes. Choose, you know, the, 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 the international companies, they could choose. For instance, Shell invested in UFRJ uh -huh. uh, as well. Uh, we have some uh, uh, other companies invested in the Catholic University. So we have, the requirement was not to invest in that specific university. It was that they should invest in Brazilian universities, yes, university yes. research centers or local uh, service centers. But, they but could could, the, the curiosity that I have is the following. I mean, is that that is the exception? It's not the rule. I mean, if you look at, if you, I mean, if you look at, uh, at, 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 I mean, at countries that are not. I mean, Brazil at the time was not an industrial country in the nineteen seventy, the early seventies when you developed this. These policies. I mean, probably Brazil was maybe regarded as a third world country at the time. I mean, in the in the in the, in the, in the world economy or in the world uh, in the geopol geopolitical in world geopolitical system. Maybe my question is, however, Brazil did that. I mean, my, my, the, the the thing that kills me in curiosity is because you know, for example, we have an old you, we have an older oil industry than you. Our oil industry is almost a hundred years old. I mean, the, the, our state company is older than Petrobras. Uh, also, you can argue that Venezuela's uh, before the disaster that Venezuela is enduring, unfortunately, uh, also had a situation simil similar situation. Mexico has a similar situation. If you go to Africa, the situation is, of course, even deeper than that. I mean, pretty much nobody does that. I mean, among 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 uh, countries that that they decide or, or or somehow are confronted with the need to to create an oil industry. Most of us don't do it. I mean, most of us don't do it in the sense that we don't develop a technological sector. We don't do it. I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't invest in, we don't have these big investments in universities. We don't have research centers. We don't have, we don't create technology. We don't do any of that. We completely rely on international companies to satisfy a hundred percent the technological needs that we have. And so my question is, do you have any idea why did you do it? <laughs> it was why? a political decision. Why, 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 was why was it? It was a political decision. We had, it, it was not easy. There was resistance. Uh, From even who? Content policy and uh, R&D policy, they're not like unanimous uh, success. Yes. There was yes. a lot of resistance, especially from the companies that had oh, to. Oh, of course, of course, yes. And uh, what we had to do, we had to calibrate and so it was a political decision in, in the sense that we had to calibrate and include when you do when we do the math of the gov total government take, we had to calibrate to account, you know, for those investments. So we, we account those uh, uh, specifically the R and D clause. Mm -hmm. So uh, you could argue that uh, it's only one percent, but you could argue that the Brazilian government decided to to you know to direct that one percent instead of including it in the in the uh, government take. It decided to 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 direct it to the. Uh, and, 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 and what difference? What difference? Do you, do you have any idea? I mean, you're a very young person. You were not alive when, when these things were decided. I'm sure. But I mean, but but my question is: Do you know what it had been? Has anybody measured? I'm sure it has measured the impact. I mean, how has it impacted? Did this decision of actually develop an, developing a local technology, developing local factories, local 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 um, excuse me local engineering companies, all these services and products that you guys have in Brazil? How how what has been? Has anybody measured the impact, both in economic terms, maybe? In social terms, in any way that you can, how would how would Brazil industry how would, how would how would the Brazilian industry would be if that hadn't been done, as opposed to how it is today? You see what I mean? Yes, uh, we have some 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 measures uh, for uh, local content impact and uh, 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 jobs and and you know. Exactly. And, I'll, I'll just check the, the, the last one, uh, the last number uh, I said, that, let me just recover because I don't want to, to yeah, say it no my mind. Uh, last number I said, uh, uh, I, it, it uh, measures the, the income effect of mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. 
the it, revenue? Mm -hmm. it, it's not precisely the revenue because it was more than the, the absolute revenue. They measured mm. the, 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 like the secondary effects. Okay, okay, I understand, yes. So, yes. Yeah. Externalities and, or whatever, as they call it. Yes, and uh, for instance, for oil and gas, this, they, they, uh, we have a measure for socioeconomic ref, uh, effects. So for uh, each 1 billion reais uh, of investments, we have 30, 13,000 jobs and we have an extra uh, 300 million reais as you know, in, what the measure of income. And profit you, you want, okay. The, yes, the, 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 the extra that was added to the Brazilian uh, PIB uh, for exploration production only, that effect is for each, uh, each billion reais in operation, ENP operation, we have an extra 560 million reais mm -hmm. and we have 3,000 jobs generated so mm -hmm. uh, this kind of effect we are still trying to measure the social effects on the municipalities mm -hmm. trying to measure that but it's uh the the results it, it's very challenging from the from a methodological point of view mm -hmm. the local content uh, and the in the r d clauses they 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 you know they they were very successful but the local content itself, how it was done, mm -hmm. it resulted in some inefficient companies. So you have to account for that. That's a lesson we learned. Like we mm -hmm. have, uh, uh, there's no, there's a case of a Brazilian company to that uh, uh, to build uh, FPSOs that commission had commission like twenty FPSOs and mm -hmm. it bankrupt. <laughs> It was not a successful, uh, a success uh, story. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we have some we have some numbers. The idea is that um, uh, the costs and benefits of the 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 local content here. Local content. Let me just check. Mm -hmm. uh, the number we have, we generated 700,000 jobs and there was a direct impact of 3% in the Brazilian uh, GDP product. Okay. Uh, huge. In the huge. last, it was, uh, we have owning salaries we generated 5 billion reais in salaries. Uh, and, uh, just, just this figure that you say that 700,000 jobs is, that's enormous. I mean, that's a, that's, a that, that's, a, that's, that's, that's enormous, huge. yes. That's, huge. that's why I say, I mean, uh, the, of course, uh, there, there were mistakes and we uh, have to adjust. That's why I said flexibility is important. But it was a very successful policy, you know, in terms of jobs and, and, and investments. Of course, it was not perfect and we had to improve it. But, you know, it, it was, it had a, a very positive mm -hmm. results uh, for the, the number of workers. Uh, we had a, a growth in a hundred, 156 percent of jobs mm -hmm. oil and gas mm -hmm. sector by official statistics and so you do you know in the in the brazilian gdp what what is the place of the oil industry as a generator of gdp i mean what is the third or the second one or the first one or how is it is it it's the it's the third one mm -hmm. It accounts, I think it was in my in my presentation. Yes, I think it was. I forgot this. Yeah. <laughs> it's the third one. And uh, but it accounts for, the numbers are mixed. Mm -hmm. uh, 
depending on who you ask. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Out for 9% uh, of the Brazilian GDP, depends on how you measure. But I've seen uh, 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 I've seen papers that says it's only five percent. Sure, sure. And the Brazilian Industry Association, Oil Industry Association, says it's thirteen percent. Of course, of course, yeah. I, 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 would, I would I would yeah. stick with nine percent. San Abiras, yeah, I understand what you're saying. So uh, another question that I have is related to the is a, is, a, is a, in regard to to the regions. The, the local regions where the oil was uh, found, I mean, especially the coast areas, no? I mean, in the south of Brazil, the Santos Basin and all that. I mean, it's a, the, the, Brazil, the, the offshore uh, uh, oil is distributed on a long stretch of the, of the Brazilian coast, on the Atlantic Ocean. It's long. It's probably several thousand kilometers or something like that. So it, it probably encompasses several, several regions of Brazil that are politically different and ethnically different economically different and so on and so forth. So my question is how, how, what importance or what, how, how, how important was the role that was given to the local communities, to the local, yeah, the local people in the areas that, that, that the resource was going to be developed so that in the sense that they would be empowered to take, to make some of the decisions. You see what I mean? They, they were not only, uh, they, they were not only hired to do certain job or so, but they were also some, in some way empowered to be the managers, the engineers, the, the high level technicians. I mean, I'm, first, I'm asking if that happened and if it happened, how did it happen? <laughs> you see- I, 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 I understood uh, it happened, but uh, not as a mandatory decision. Yeah. Uh, in 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 Rio, it happened because you know the, the was already here. Petrobras was already here, so sure, sure. already had the capability. Uh, when you move to towards other states, there was a specific part of the R and D clause was applied in uh, in technical capability formation, yeah. specifically for you know. Oil and gas technician, chemistry technician, uh, uh, not in the uh, uh, graduate level of mm -hmm. universities, but in the technical level. Sure. I don't know if in Colombia you have that, you know, as, as well. Yes. It's not high school, you know, it's technical formation, but it's not the university as well. Sure, sure. Uh, so at first, uh, we had was part of the RD clause was directed towards that uh, capabilities and part in the universities were directed to creating, uh, you know, petroleum engineering courses, petroleum engineering labs. So we had several universities opening uh, energy economics, energy law, uh, uh, petroleum engineering, uh, 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 geology, geology yes. uh, majors. So, uh, uh, in, and you have uh, grants for the for the teachers. You had grants for building the labs and the capabilities, and you know specific for that formations. Not only in UFRJ but in other universities as well. We had, if I'm not mistaken, 34 universities that joined the program. So 34 different university in Brazil had, um, uh, you know programs designed to 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 provide for uh, specific majors in, in, in that way the idea was precisely to to build a capability I was a part of this program I was I so was you, you would have a beneficiary of that program you mean yes yes I I, I had a scholarship in UFRJ they had you had mm -hmm. a scholarship it was a good one to keep the good students, you know, in the energy programs. Mm -hmm. It was like double of the average scholarships in Brazilian universities. So it was it, uh, the idea was to to have capability to to you know to to uh, for those industries. Sure. But it, it was not uh, Brazilian. Uh, I would also say that in a different sector, the Brazilian uh, labor laws, they not related to oil industry, but Brazilian labor laws in general have a maximum amount of foreigners that you can contract. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Not very low that you can hire. It's not very low, but they're there, you know? Mm -hmm. And the oil and gas industry, they have different, uh, uh, different uh, percentages, spe specifically because of the amount of offshore workers that are foreign, uh, employees, foreign, uh, they, they come from other nationalities. Uh, but the idea was that in order to meet labor law, the Brazilians, we had to, we either would change the labor law or we had to build our own capabilities. So we have we had lots of universities opening specific uh, majors for the oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think for companies, uh, it was not it it was not bad because they had to invest the money anyways. So sure. uh, the 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 R and D clause had to be invested, but. To be honest, it was uh, most of the money ca came from Petrobras. Mm -hmm. Petrobras was the operator uh, in the beginning of the policy. Pet since Petrobras had the operating fields from Rodada Zero, Petrobras was the operator that had, you know, the beginning of the policy. The Brazilian government had to set the policy negotiating with only one company, basically. The others, they they kind of joined a policy that was already set. Progress, yes. Mm -hmm. If you're, if I, if I made myself clear. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You know, from a policy design point of view, it it was kind of easier to have. Uh, 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 in the beginning, it was easier to design a policy that way. Okay. Okay. But I think uh, both policies, they had very good results. They had its mistakes as well. Sure, sure. But I think the, the something that I would uh, include is that uh, it's, it's kind of short-term and long-term scenarios, you know? Mm -hmm. You have, in order to keep, uh, to keep the investment attractive, mm -hmm. if you're going to impose local content requirements and R&D requirements, uh, you cannot charge as much signature bonus, for instance. Sure, sure, so uh, uh, we had to choose, you know, the initial signature bonus were actually, you know, not, not very high. Only <laughs> the past three years, we had those major, you know, mm -hmm. breaking signature bonus. If you okay. out uh, uh, of the, of the equation, signature bonus in Brazil, uh, were uh, uh, they were not in the billion reais uh, uh, clause? They, they were around two million reais, three million reais. You know, it was a fair amount of money, but uh, in order to keep the investment attractive, uh, uh, we had to. We have a model in the Brazilian government, you know, to to like IHS and Wood Mackenzie, you know, like those companies have, yeah. but we have one looking from the Brazilian government perspective. And we try to model that uh, and to, in order to, to adjust. It's also, it's, all, it's difficult. It's no, not, it's, but, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big subject, yes, I, I see. Yeah, and finally, just to close maybe considering the time, uh, I am just, do you have any idea? I mean, but, correct me if I'm wrong, please, but, but I understand that Brazil doesn't export a lot of oil. Pretty much all the oil that you produce is consumed locally, isn't it? I mean, you don't, you don't really export a lot of oil. So you, so the, 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 how do you say? I mean, the money that you make out of oil is indirectly in, in the sense that it supplies energy to the oil, to the Brazilian industry and to, I mean, to make the country run pretty much. I mean, that's what I'm saying, but my, or, or first of all, is that correct or is that only partially correct? I don't know. Only partially correct. We export okay. a lot. Oh, sorry. Okay. Our, no, it's because of refining uh, cap capabilities. It mm -hmm. was built, uh, you know, for other kind of crude products. Yeah. Petrobras tries to adapt our refining uh, uh, capacity to our crude product oil, but we still have to the the, the in the balance Brazil. Yeah. Depends. We still had to have to export a lot and import a lot, and in some oil products, diesel, liquefied petroleum gas, 
uh, for yeah. instance, yeah. we are still huge importers. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah, my question was directed to the following. It means that most of the income that you receive, let's say, given, assuming that what I, that I was saying was 100% true, which it is, and I understand. I mean, but most of the income it doesn't come from selling oil. I mean, it's not to international in the international market. Most of the money that is made out of the out of the production of oil in that sense is not is not made by selling the oil. That's that's my point. I mean, do you? My question is: Do you know? You, I presume or I assume that you guys sell the technology. I mean, that, that's this technology that you have managed to to create for all these years, almost forty years or so. The offshore technology, you guys have the world record in deep water, for example. You guys, you are capable of drilling a, a well in 4,000 feet, almost 4,000 meters of water, and so on and so forth. So, so you made a lot of a lot of critical technical developments, uh, technological developments to make possible, to make all this possible. Uh, so my question is, do you do you have any idea how much money does Brazil make out of the sale of that technology? That you sell it to other companies, or you license it, or you or Petrobras charges for applying that technology overseas, or, 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 or how does that work? I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that. Oh, okay, okay, that's fine. I don't know. All right, all right. All right. But it's a very interesting question. I'll find yeah. out and get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Well, considering the time, I, I'm sorry, I, I haven't seen more, more, many more questions here on the, on the chat either, so I think uh, this was a very, at least to me, I hope this, this, the same feeling is shared by the people that are still online, it was a very enlightening presentation, very thorough, very detailed, uh, very nicely uh, uh, created too. I mean, it was very well made. And so I want to thank you again in the name of the university, uh, this university in the name of the Colombian oil industry, which we want it to be better and better each time. We hope to, that we can learn a little, little, little bit at least from what you have told us. and. And, and that's it. Thank you so much. And, and uh, I hope we somehow uh, meet sometime in the future, either here or in Brazil or, or here. After, after this, everything, the, after everything goes back to... Uh, to hopefully, hopefully the virus will go away and we'll have us, we will have a normal life again soon. All right. Yes, I hope, uh, I hope that uh, we can, uh, I, I was glad to, to have uh, invited to speak here. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I'll send. I'll send the presentation. You know, feel free. Please, to, please, 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 please. To so we, we, will, we will. We will. We will. We will make the presentation available for people to download it if it's okay with you. Yes. And yes. also, also a, a, a recording of this uh, presentation, the audio and video. Is, is that okay with you? If we, if we make that available. Yeah. So no okay. problem. All right. That's it. Thank you so much again. And uh, you know, maybe, see, maybe see you next can, time. Yes. Sure. And have a great day over there, okay? You, you too. Bye. Bye. Okay. A ver. Bueno, muchas gracias a los que están todavía.